My name is Jonathan Berman. I represent Fieldstone. We're a boutique investment bank, uh, privately owned by our employees. Uh, we've been operating for 22 years, uh, and of those, for 16 years in Africa. Uh, we've concluded transactions of various types in about 20 countries across the region, uh, principally in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. And we're currently active in about a dozen of those countries with, with mandates at the moment. Uh, the difference in Fieldstone's business focus from probably the other speakers is that we don't have a large balance sheet of our own. Um, we take small stakes occasionally in projects where we've advised, we roll up fees and so on. But our, our major interaction with institutional investors is either we are advising projects who are looking to talk to the likes of, of the investors here, um, or we are advising um, some of the private equity funds who are in the infrastructure space. Uh, it's been an interesting trend in the past few years. We've seen a lot more of the general private equity funds, not just the infrastructure specialists, start to look at Africa. Now, that may be because it's, it's hard uh, to raise new funds, so there's a, there's a shortage of high-quality funds such as, as those up here on the panel today, um, but it's been an interesting shift. Uh, we look at a very broad range of infrastructure from telecoms at one end down to the energy component leading into power generation at the other end. Um, and across that space, um, you know, with the, uh, particularly in the core infrastructure, um, there has been a, a, a real shortage of, of high quality investors around. And it's interesting to see the environment growing. And I think that's a very positive sign for the continent. Um, Mr. Chair, since we've we finished our introductions, mm -hmm. can, I, can I make a first general comment, not Please. about uh, uh, my firm? The, the overwhelming problem issue that we face today uh, is actually not political risk in the sense of our investors going to lose their money. The overwhelming issue, and it's been an issue for many years, and it's improving, but it's still an issue, is will deals close? Which deals will close? Uh, and it's related to political risk because in many cases, the reason deals don't close is regulatory issues, is decision-making by public sector bodies, whether they're regulators, uh, whether they're uh, political entities getting involved in transactions, um, whether they are state utilities acting as off-takers or hosts, that remains the biggest challenge to getting deals done. Uh, it's not to say there is no political risk after deals close, but the hard fact is that the history of closed private sector infrastructure deals in Africa is actually pretty good once they've closed. Very, very few have been impacted by political risk. Uh, I, I, would, I would actually challenge the audience to say that it's more in Africa than in any other portion of the world, including the US or the UK or other em emerged markets. But the biggest problem is still getting the deals to close and engaging the public sector to, to get a faster rate of deal closure and greater certainty. I think one of the issues in the markets outside Africa has been that people have realized in recent years that infrastructure isn't actually one asset class, it's a couple of different asset classes. Uh, there is the really low risk stuff, let's take a, a private power project, which once it's up and running, absent a major unexpected event, is, is fairly low risk. It's got a political risk component to it, so you're pricing at a premium to that political risk or regulatory risk. Okay, and that's not to say things can't go wrong. Technically, they can't go wrong if a market deregulated, as they have happened. But that ought to be the lowest end of the risk spectrum. At the other end, you may have something like a toll road, and I'm sure Andrew can speak to experience of that, which may be a very good investment, but has a little more traffic, market risk, and probably some higher returns if you get it right. I think in Africa, that, I'm, as far as I can tell, that debate is not very hot, partly just because not enough deals have been done. And it'll be a good thing if that debate becomes hot because we've got a, a mature enough market. Um, but that may, be, that may be just a sign of, of, of the market being a little bit immature. I, I would like to see a few more of those very low risk deals being done by pension funds in this market. Um, I'd ask the other members of the panelists for some ideas as to how that's going to happen, but I think that would be a, a great place for them to start. If, if, if pension funds were to take direct risk in some of the higher risk end of the infrastructure spectrum and then get their fingers burnt, that could help to set the market back. Maybe I could just respond to the comment about um, public sector shareholder decision making and also lender decision making by 
telling you one little, little story of a deal we worked on about a year ago that was a good story. Uh, and it's a project called the Morapuli Colliery in Botswana. Now, people may say, is a colliery infrastructure? Uh, this one, to my mind, was because it's a, it's a tide mine. It, 95% of its output goes to the state-owned power station next door. It's not an export producer. It's not a market commodity producer. It sells at a fixed price in local currency. So it's, it's got a lot of the characteristics of an infrastructure project. Uh, Morapuli Colliery raised 1.7 billion Botswana Pula, about 300 million US dollars, in a total process from the appointment of advisors to financial close of 11 months, and the appointment of the banking group was much shorter, it was about eight months. Um, it was able to do that for two reasons. First of all, all of the lenders were local. So the decision-making chains were shorter. Uh, I mean, they, they were all subsidiaries of international banks, but a lot of decisions were made on the ground. And their willingness to take a simple view of complex political issues in their own country was key. I don't mean that simple view was, was stupid. I just mean it was a pragmatic view that we're in our own country, we cannot document everything perfectly, but we're here, we understand the environment, we'll make a judgment call, number one. Secondly, from the shareholder point of view, uh, Morapuli was interesting in that it was owned by Debswana. Now, Debswana, as some of you may know, is a public-private joint venture itself. Um, at the time, it was owned by, by De Beers, um, Anglo, and the government of Botswana. This is before Anglo bought De Beers. What Debswana had as, a, as an entity was interesting. It had government saying this project should happen. It had government willing to inject most of the equity funds. It had government willing to provide support for the state-owned power company. It was the off-taker. They provide a, a letter of comfort. So all of that government pushed for it to happen. But the actual project was managed by private sector project managers in Debswana. And although Debswana would probably admit they're not you know, the fastest moving private sector company in the world, it was still a private sector process. And on a few occasions, government said to us, please, don't make this entity a state-owned vehicle because it'll slow us down. We'll have to get the privatization agency involved and so on. But there was a, an existing structure within Debswana that allowed it to be run a little bit arm's length with government still consulted, sitting on the board. Uh, now, Debswana is a unique model, but the fact is there was a, a domestically funded large project financing closed in less than a year. Uh, maybe other countries can look at something like that kind of model. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.